so uh, congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. How Thanks. do you? I mean, I'm, thank you for coming here too. I guess it's such an honor to be here. I mean, I'm a huge fan of yours, and and actually now that we are are neighbors in Oak Park, I can That's say right. I'm, I'm a huge fan of your community. <laughs> <as> well. <laughs> well, I've kind of grown that community. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm crediting you with, with creating a, a wonderful the school system. My I've built it from scratch. <laughs> yeah, you've done a great job there, actually. So let's get into the show. Tell me about the show, and I know you guys have been working on it for the past couple of months or so. There was a lot of buzz. What makes it different from what went on before, and what's going on in other afternoon public radio shows around the country? I mean, that's actually a really good question because... Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Um, so here's what's going on with public radio stations across the country. Between the hours of basically nine and four, nobody's listening. I mean, despite the fact that, that we're all you know, attached to Fresh Air or, or Talk of the Nation or all of these other shows, th the reality is every station that is a news talk station in public radio is really struggling. They see lots of listenership during Morning Edition and All Things Considered, and then things just sort of bottom out. And that's not true of radio listening in general, and it's not true of music stations within the public radio universe as well. So for like really the last 20 years, every station in the country that, that cares to pay attention to this has tried to figure out what is it that would get people to listen more actively during the daytime. And there's a lot of sense that like, people are just talked out. You know, I mean, you're at work, you're doing whatever, and as great as those shows are, it's hard to actually sit down and concentrate and listen to a full one-hour conversation. And sometimes you just you want to turn off the radio, you want to go to music, you want to do any other thing, but listen to yet another conversation about X, Y, and Z. You know? Well, the, the problem, if yeah. I may, <laughs> Seems to be yes. that, and maybe I'm, I'm getting this wrong, but a lot of people who listen to public radio tend to be educated, have jobs at desks where they can't be listening to people talking about stuff. It might be hard to get people at work to listen to talk radio. So how do you overcome that challenge of saying, you know, between two and four, leave the office, don't do work, listen to my show? I mean, that's a gr <laughs> You know, I think um, what we're trying to do is essentially create just a, a little bit of a different vibe in the afternoon that basically allows people to sort of plug in, but also is thinking about where they are in the day. So it's parents picking up kids from school. It's people who've been running around crazy all day long and sit back at their desk for the first time and have maybe 10 minutes just to sort of check in and want to know what's happening in the world. Um, it's also people who are just completely exhausted by a nonstop stream of information coming over Twitter or on the internet, and they just want to actually have a bit of a release sometime. So okay. I shouldn't say that nobody listens. I mean, lots of people are listening, but there's just this huge gulf here, and we're trying to figure out why that's the case and how we actually can keep people who love public radio listening a little bit longer. Okay, and so the other thing is we're trying to keep people <laughs> focused on Chicago. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, you, okay, focus on Chicago. And I want to ask you about that because this week I thought you, you were interviewing the editor of, or one of the editors at Chicago Magazine yeah. about their, their power list. And they were talking about uh, the people in Chicago who, who have the most power. Um, and then you asked a question which, which I loved, which was, okay, in New York, people in power you know are often people in the financial world. In LA, people in power are in Hollywood. In DC, power, obviously, government. And you asked, what is it about Chicago? Where is the power lie? Well, let's broaden that beyond, Chica beyond power. Yeah. What to you is Chicago? You've been here for many years. I know you're not from here, but you're a Chicagoan at this point. What, what is Chicago and what is Chicago radio? I mean, those are, in some respects, two slightly different questions. Because I think, you know, Chicago, in some respects, and in fact, I'll answer them both by saying this. I actually think one of the things that's frustrating about Chicago, for me, having been here for the better part of 20 years, is the fact that Chicago is an amazing city with unbelievable talent, great creativity, incredible musicians, great writers, artists, some of the most interesting and important academics, uh, great power structure, amazing businesses, et cetera, et cetera. And yet the narrative, the meta narrative on Chicago really hasn't changed since A.J. Liebling came to town and wrote The Second City. 
the it's the a broad city that, thing. I or? mean, the whole idea that it's a city that, that we hear all these tropes. You know, the city. Uh, it's a city of big shoulders. It's a city of neighborhoods, and all those things are fundamentally true. But I think you know the thing that actually stood out to me when we we actually were away from Chicago for a year. And there were a lot of corruption trials happening. There were, everything was going on, you know, just a pace in Chicago. We were away from Chicago. I looked back and I realized I didn't need to follow anything that was happening in Chicago news because I knew the storyline. It was sort of played out in local media in, term, in terms of a D's Dem and Doe's and it's hot dogs and it's neighborhoods and it's hey, corruption. Hey, 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 hold you on. Know? We got Doug on the show today. <laughs> I know. But that's a, that's, that's a new narrative. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I think that the, that the frustration, I think, with Chicago um, – in my, in my, from my point of view, is a sense that I think Chicago is a much more dynamic, much more interesting place. We we look too often to the coast for our cues. We look to New York. We look to L. A. Um, in fact, I grew up in Kansas City, and I feel like the way local media treats like celebrity here has so much more in common with Kansas City than a place that's as dynamic and talented and fascinating as Chicago. I know. It's like, can you believe that guy was at Gibson's? Yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. It's yeah. so. It's it's just yeah. It's it's pathetic at times. Yeah. <laughs> I did once see Derek Rose at Gibson's. Um, okay, so what's the answer? The answer, in part, hopefully, is afternoon shift. You've had a week now. We which think is, it is the we, entire answer to everything the, <laughs> I just talked about. So a week is, is nothing in terms of radio, but you've gotten a start. What are, you, what are you trying to do? What is happening on afternoon shift? What happened this week? And what do you see a year down the road, two years down the road, in its ideal form. We're billing it as a show that's a, a daily conversation about news, culture, and ideas. And the idea is that we want it to be, first and foremost, interactive with the audience. So we need to push that much more in terms of social like media. Calls? Yeah, absolutely. But you know, not so much that, like you say, and now is the time in the show when we take calls. And more that calls are just organic, like the number is always out there. And you and I are talking on the air, and all of a sudden, the number's just always out there, and somebody calls in, and it's John from Algonquin, and he has a great thing to add, and we put him on the air. As opposed to saying there, there's a time for no calls, and there's a time for calls. So much more interactive, much more engaged with even just live events and the community, and, and being just, I think, in touch with what people are talking about more. The other thing is, we want it to be, I think, a place where you can unpack the news of the day, sort of bring context, but also at times just sort of look out at the world you know, I, I said this to a colleague. I said, you know, for as important as the, the local news diet is, and I think it's vitally important, and as dedicated as we are to it, and there's no change in that whatsoever, I think oftentimes what editors and reporters think is most important in any given day um, may actually have no relationship to what concerns those of us who are living our daily lives. If you were to poll reporters and editors in most newsrooms and say, what are the top five most important things in your life right now? What are the top five things that worry you the most in your life right now, I guarantee it, no matter what the newsroom is in Chicago, if you took those lists, it would be shocking the degree to which most of the stories they're writing don't actually appear on the list that they've just created. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, We're worried about parenting, we're worried about retirement, we're worried about global warming, we're worried about all sorts of things, you know? And oftentimes the news agenda is really about, you know, what somebody said in response to something somebody else said down at City Hall, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we don't sort of play big enough. So I, I really want this to be about um, local relevance, not just sort of local headline. And I want it also to be a show that, back to my earlier point, says that that asserts that Chicago's at the center of the conversation, the center of uh, the local conversation, the regional conversation, the national conversation, and the international conversation. That there is no reason why Chicago can't be at the center of every important issue, every important trend, every important sort of artistic endeavor that's happening right now. We have the talent for it, we have the resources for it, and I'd like for the show to assert that more. You've been a radio guy all your career. What is it about the radio form that can do that in a way that other media can't? Um, I mean, I'm not sure that it can, except for the fact that I think radio is intensely personal. I think radio, I mean, the thing that's kept radio viable over 75 years of, you know, technological threats, right, from, you know, television and film and everything else, is the fact that it's intensely personal, it's participatory in the sense that not just Colin, but you actually create the picture in your own mind. I actually think in some respects it's much more visual at its best than even film or television. You should have a contest where people have to draw what they think you look like. <laughs> That'd be scary, yeah. <laughs> um, 
so that's, I mean, that's stuff I think that's radio could do. I'm going to leave that. Yeah. Um, I've got more ideas if you want them. <laughs> and I think the other thing about, um, about radio, too, just practically speaking, is it's, it's portable, right? Um, you, I mean, you can take it with you. So mobile devices, everything else, audio is portable. You can multitask with it. So I think there are some things that everybody, even though they say radio is dead, um, I think there's some things about audio that fundamentally will actually endure. And, you know, the people that say radio is dead, the only thing I would say in response to that is the business model might be dead, but is listening dead? And you should just say, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I should. Yeah. I should. I should. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about your, your career. You did 848 for, for a while, yeah. from 1999 to 2007. What led up to that? How did you get into public radio? Why public radio? Yeah. And, and then, and then, why did you leave? Oh, okay. Um, so I grew up in Kansas City. I grew up actually in Overland Park, Kansas. Anybody in Overland Park, Overland Park Kansas here? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. One woo. Uh, I describe it locally. My wife's heard this a million times. It's, it's sort of like Naperville, but without the culture. Um, <laughs> And uh, my dad was, I mean, dad's just a really curious guy. He's not a guy who, you know, uh, went to graduate school or is not very, you know, learned in the, in the classical sense, but is just an in, totally curious about the world in general. And he fell in love with public radio in the earliest days. He did a lot of traveling throughout the Midwest. He was a salesperson and would be on these back roads through small towns in Kansas. And, you know, up and down looking for a station that he can listen to to pass the time. Because Kansas, as you might know, is not actually the most fascinating place topographically and geographically sure. in the United States. Sure. I don't want to dispel any myths there, but no, no. it Just can be a little boring. Mountain Kansas yeah. does not exist. <laughs> And so he fell in love with it. And then as a kid growing up, it was just always on in the car. And I stopped after a while objecting because I knew I wasn't getting where. And he just started listening. So, you know, my, as pathetic as it sounds, my, you know, my introduction to news, my idols growing up were people like Cokie Ro Roberts and Nina Totenberg and so forth. And so I knew from a pretty early age, once I was interested in journalism, that I wanted to be in public radio. And it took me a while to get back to that. Um, but ultimately, I was, I'd applied, actually, my first job out of college was here in Chicago at Leo Burnett. Oh, wow. And I spent a couple of years. I've heard of that place. Yeah. 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 Yes. And so, and it was a great place to work. And, but I also realized I still had this deep interest in journalism. So I applied, literally, I think, to every single job that WBEZ posted <laughs> between 1993 and, say, 1996. And I got nowhere. I mean, you, it was you know, administrative assistant. It was producer on the show. It was part-time this. Nothing. And fast forward a couple of years after I had gotten some jobs producing and reporting and so on and so forth, there was a job to host 848 that had come up. The show had just been on for a year. They were looking for a replacement host. And my whole MO was just to see if I could get an interview. Like, you know, time had passed. I'd gone off. I'd improved my skills. I'd had this experience. And I just wanted to see, did anybody there even know that I existed? <laughs> had anybody... Yeah. It, it, did, did I just rate on the radar? And I, that was my whole MO. I wasn't actually looking for a new gig at the time. And it turns out that they did see my resume, that they asked me to come in for an interview. And lo and behold, I was hired. And I think I was hired mostly because I was super cheap. <laughs> I was a guy that they just didn't know. And they thought that, you know, they could bring me in and, and build a show around it. And Was that that's the beginning it. of the show? That was the second year of the show, actually. Okay. Yeah. So they fired the first guy. didn't work out. Right. Brought you in. Right. Uh, and then you do it for, what, eight years? Eight, nine years? Yeah, it's about eight years. And then why? I mean, to me, that seems, what a fantastic job. Did you get sick of the repetition? Was there a, you know, okay, now, we're, like you were saying, now we're doing the corruption story. Now we're doing this story. Why did you leave? Well, I didn't have any plans to leave um, permanently, though I did have an opportunity to take a fellowship. I was able to take a sabbatical in Ann Arbor at University of Michigan for a year. And so, and the station was great about it. And the, the whole operation said, okay, you take a break for a year, you can come back and resume the show. And... That's what I went away with, and I was looking forward to coming back. But about midway through the year that I was away, I started to realize 
I didn't miss the show the way I thought I would. In fact, my wife said, you are not going to be able to survive two weeks. You're going to be on the phone. You're going to be on email. You're going to be hounding everybody on the show. You're not going to be able to survive this year away. You've just, you've been too immersed in it. And part of me thought she was, she was going to be right. And it turns out that we were both wrong. And I really started to feel like, wait a second, I don't feel that burn to go back. And as it was my dream gig, it was an, I mean, it was a, an opportunity of a lifetime. I loved the team. I loved everything about that experience and still do. But I also felt like if I didn't have that burn that I should maybe check into that and figure out what was going on. And there's also something about the show, it's, it's relentless. I mean, all of these shows, Terry Gross and Ira Glass and all these people you ask, it is relentless, as wonderful as it is, to be paid essentially to go and talk to fascinating people. It's the greatest gift you could ever ask for. It's also relentless. So, you know, we have two young kids. My work week started at two on Sunday and would end at about seven o'clock on Friday. Most nights, you know, you race home, you give the kids a kiss, you know, and snarf down dinner, and then you are straight up studying for the next day. It's like being a kind of perpetual finals week, you sure. know? And I think after a while, that, that wears on people. And so you look for ways to sort of offset that. And I think all that stuff was coming. Plus, I was just interested in other stuff. And I was interested in what was happening with digital media. And anyway, as it turned out, when I came back, um, I said, hey, I'm totally up for the show again. And I would be completely honored to continue it. But if there's something else you think that might be be a good match with my skill set, I'd be interested. And it turns out at the time they had a need for somebody to fill in as program director. So I ended up thinking that would be a cool experience and I did it. Do you, now that you're back in it, are you feeling yourself caught back up? Do you have the bug again? Do you think, I gotta get, I can't wait to the next show? Yeah. I mean, I have to say, uh, first of all, I was terrified. Were you nervous on the first yeah, show? Yeah, absolutely. It did, I mean, it honestly terrified. did not seem like that. You, you are, you, it seemed like you took, you took over where you left off. I mean, That's very nice. Yeah, I did not feel that way at all. In fact, I will tell you guys this. I came you down... You shit your pants. No. <laughs> almost. Almost. I don't know why I'm so crass I, tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> no more swears for me. I came down four days before the launch. I came down with shingles. No way. Yeah. What is shingles? If you, let me ask you this. Yeah. If you've had chicken pox, can you get shingles? Yes. yes. I thought it was the opposite. No, That's no, so it's, it's latent in you. And, and one of the triggers is extreme stress. Wow. Yeah. And so I was terrified. I was terrified of all sorts of You should have had things. a fill-in host on your first day. Yeah. <laughs> Believe me. Yeah. The thought cry. And then I thought about retiring after the first day <laughs> as well. Um, but the issue for me, I was also trying to finish up the job that I was on. And you're trying to plan a show and finish the job that you're on. It's kind of a hard thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, that first show, everybody is judging it. And it's unlike, say, a theater performance where you've been rehearsing. And even though the show might be refined, you know, you've decided to do the play. And this is going to be the play for the entire run. And hopefully it's where it needs to be on opening night. But, you know, you're certainly not doing a new play the next night. Right. Um, the same is true with film. You know, you, you're... The film is out, and you can sort of judge the finished product. And I think radio shows never really are what they're going to be on that first show, certainly. And I knew that, and I knew that people would be judging it pretty acutely. And so there was a sense of just trying to make sure that it wasn't a disaster and that you hopefully communicated as much of the kinds of trends and ideas that we were talking about at the beginning early on so people don't completely rejected early on. Well, I think it, it sounds great. The show is on from 2 to 4 on WBEZ 91.5. Steve Edwards, everyone. Thanks, buddy. Thank you very much. Thanks.